So welcome to Ivan. Thank you for this very, very much. And we'll, 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 we'll discuss uh, uh, the various exhibitions which have taken place over the course of this next 40 minutes. Um, but just to add that uh, I, I have, from my own experience, um, found the Freud Museum to be one of London's truly great secret museums. Um, it's run in a, in a brilliant way, I feel, and I've always enjoyed any time that I've spent there, both as an audience, uh, a member, and a part of it, just someone making my way about the Freud. But I've also been fortunate to, to work on one, one, one or two projects, and one of them was with an artist called Ellen Gallagher, uh, an American um, uh, artist who um, was uh, obsessed with the story of uh, uh, what's called the Middle Passage, where um, black slaves have been known to be thrown overboard in, uh, in the days of uh, slave trading. Um, uh, during the middle part of the passage, it was uh, the case in her, in her imagination that these corpses would develop and merge and mingle with sea life and that the sea life would develop the features of uh, and characteristics of uh, certain Africans. And the long and short of it was that we went to meet Ivan and Michael, um, with whom Ivan was, and, we, and, I, and, and I said, well, I hope in this meeting there might be a connection between um, Ellen Gallagher, who's here with us, and Freud. And I think you asked, uh, Ellen, what, what, what kind of work do you make? And she said, well, I'm doing highly detailed drawings of sea creatures, at which point I immediately got up and said, eel testicles, and went to a box where he then removed some of Freud, Sigmund Freud's earliest drawings of these articles. And it was extraordinary to see, because he had studied in Trieste, and he'd looked at certain um, biologies, and this became incredibly important to his studies. Uh, but maybe we'll, we'll come back to that later. But my first question to you, Ivan, is just to say, how, how long has the Freud been engaging with artists and artists' show? Um, <coughs> yeah, quite, quite. Before I answer that, can I just say yeah. that um, <coughs> you should know, given your latest show, that the Freud Museum, Museum last year did a conference called Remote Control, <laughs> Psychoanalysis and Television. And we're working right now on a on a book of the co conference, so there will be we would maybe we'll have to get you back. Again. So, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and noticing on the blackboard there that that Murray's in the final. Uh, we were also doing sport and cycle analysis, in the, in the, in the, so so a broad remit, as you can see from the museum. Um, We've been open since 1986, which was four years after Anna Freud died, who owned the house. And the first art exhibition, I think, was about, or contemporary art exhibition, was in, in 1989. So it was kind of three. So it's quite early on. In those days, we had to keep it under wraps. So the first exhibition was by an artist called, who's now teaches at, at Wimbledon, I think, called Rachel Withers. I don't know if anybody been taught by her or heard of her. And she did an exhibition called Real Life, which was still one of the best <coughs> exhibitions. I mean, it was an amazing kind of intervention into the museum. She studied and, and worked at the museum for about three months and then did various sort of interventions into the, into the space, um, including things like a broken mirror on the couch, or uh, you know, two chairs opposite each other with boxing gloves on, or a loaf of bread on the dining table with a massive knife stuck into it. It's a kind of really, you know, dog turds on the carpet, you know. So, but it was actually really, really interesting using music, thinking about things like, you know, who cleaned the house, who did the vacuuming. Did, you know, I mean, it's just just a very interesting intervention. Um, but of course, we couldn't actually show it while the museum was open, so people had to make special appointments to come to see it before the museum opened, and then we'd be able to, you know, show them, and then, then it would all be packed away until the next next time. So it's a kind of very tentative beginning, really, with the art exhibitions. You know, you can and. No, 
know, we were, we were scared, really. I mean, uh, in a way, quite rightly so, because people were coming from Brazil, Argentina, Australia, Japan. You know, people are coming a long way in this pilgrimage that they make to the Freud Museum. And they don't want to see doctors on the car. They don't want, you know, they don't want to be, to have to think in that way when they have an expectation of what they're going to see, which is the couch, which is the emotional experience, you know, especially the Brazilians, who you know, where it is, you know, uh, and I'm talking to somebody who's gone to Vienna and burst into tears, so I, I don't decry the emo emotional experience. But, um, you know, so, so we kind of, we're always quite sensitive to realising we had two different audiences. And there's some, you know, and how could we find some point of contact where each audience could learn something from what was incorporated from the, from the other side? Because, of course, the art people would come along to see art exhibitions, and then they'd not be very interested in what's, the, you know, they'd just come, and, and it would be almost as if there's a parallel universe. So it's kind of, you know, which, which in, in a, you know, sometimes ha happens even still. So the first exhibition was 1989, and then probably the early 90s, it really kicked off in terms of the museum becoming known for these contemporary art exhibitions. And I suppose the first one that was significant was Susan Hiller. Yeah. Uh, and you've all probably seen the Susan Hiller work from the Freud Museum, which is her cases. And a very interesting piece, you know, that grows more, you know, she adds to it and creates new things with these objects inside cases and bits of text and images and, and a kind of creating a little museum, really, of, of her own with imaginary things. But of course, Susan Hiller is coming from an anthropological background well, you know, so there's that contribution to it as well, as well as this interest in, in psychoanalysis and teaching and thinking and so on. So, so the Susan, after the Susan Hiller exhibition, then I think there's a big explosion. Of, you know, and each year, I mean, you've got the list there. There's a lot. There's, it's a, a long list. You know, so, tell, tell us just a, a quick bit about the history of the house itself. Well, the, the house in terms of. Well, the, how, how it, well, certainly how it came to be the museum and, 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 and how, how it transformed from being, being a residence to what it is at the moment. Right, it's an inter <laughs> that, that's an interesting question. I mean, the, the house was the house that Freud lived in when he came to London. So, you know, there's the story of how he got out of Austria using contacts and, and, and uh, able to bring all of his objects with him. So that included all the kind of iconic psychoanalytic objects, the couch, his library, uh, his desk, the thousands of antiquities. That have, just before I continue, has, any, uh, has anybody here been to the Freud Museum? Or most people here? Yeah? yeah? So you know, you know, I mean, it's a very atmospheric space, especially the study and the consulting room where Freud had all of these objects that he collected, so thousands of antiquities from ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome, the Far East, even some Mesoamerican things. Um, so that's kind of intense. Um, and of course that then became the house that uh, Freud lived in. He came with his wife, he came with uh, his daughter Anna Freud, who was basically looking after him at that at that point. There was a doctor with him as well. Um, his son Ernst, his youngest son Ernst, lived in, in the area and he stayed at the hospital for a while. His wife's sister, um, Minna Bernays, she also lived with him and she'd lived with him since she you know her early twenties, I think. Uh, the housekeeper, Paula Fickle. So it's kind of quite a poor place and then of course gradually one by one, you know, Freud first, and then Minna, and then, and then Martha, his wife, and you know, they died off. And, and in the end, by 1982, when Anna Freud finally died, 
it was her and the housekeeper in this massive house in the middle. And of course it was quite dilapidated and so on. So Anna Freud had left it to become a, a museum and she left it to uh, an American foundation called the New Lang Foundation, which was a family foundation run by uh, a woman called Muriel Gardner, who was also a psychoanalyst. So, and, and somebody who'd written about one of Freud's famous cases, The Wolfman. So she was kind of a connection there. And then there was a fundraising campaign in America, and the museum was, was, um, was uh, created. In terms of how the house gets turned into a museum, of course, decisions are made. Decisions are made. I mean, I, this morning I was with, with a group of students, and they were kind of a bit dissatisfied. You know, they, they, you know, often people kind of get a sense of unreality when they come to the museum. I mean, I've known people to, to go into Freud's study, and the first thought that comes into their minds is, are these all Freud's books? And they kind of, you know, and there's some sort of, you know, and even that thought is a kind of questioning of, of the real world, you know, are these all Freud's books? And then the second thought that comes is, maybe they're not books at all. Maybe they're just the spines of books. But, you know, it's MFI, you know, it's just the spines of books that have been put there just to fool people. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of, it's very easy to kind of get that kind of you know, sense of unreality about, about the, the, the place. And of course then, they start doing a very psychoanalytic thing. They, sort of, they start noticing what's not there. What's not there. So they sort of start to say, well, where's the kitchen? Where's the bedroom? Where's the bathroom? And of course, you know, and, and they're really coming to realise that the museum, the turning of the, the house into the museum, is of course an act of conscious construction. And, if you believe Freud, as I do, unconscious construction. So something's going on in terms of, you know, somebody made a decision, the bedroom in Freud's house isn't appropriate. Who would think, you know, that Freud, who, whose first major book was The Interpretation of Dreams, you know, who wrote about sexuality all his life and thought that was so important, that the bedroom wouldn't be in the folk, you know, but somebody made that decision, so the bedroom was pushed out. The bathroom, you know, Freud's famous anal stage, you know, and the toilets being pushed out. The kitchen, you know, who, you know, with Freud's interest in the first object of a baby's life, you know, is the breast of the kitchen and eating being so important. The kitchen, you know, so all these things are put, pushed out and something happens where you just get a, a kind of um, a story of Freud being created, but a story which you could say is Freud as intelligence, as disembodied brain, you know, as something, you know, so it's a kind of very interesting construction where the house, the living house, the people living with their bodies, somehow is turned into the museum, which becomes this very cerebral thing. And of course, you know, and that perhaps contributes to, to this sense of, of unreality. Interestingly, just to add one more point, the, the, the exhibition we have at the moment, the Louise Bourgeois exhibition, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, in some ways it's bringing back some of these things that have been excluded. Because Louise Bourgeois, who's a very kind of difficult artist in lots of ways and quite abstract, but there are these sort of human organic forms, you know, the breast, the phallus, the mouth, the, you know, these things which are part of her work, which are coming back in the museum. And it's as if, you know, the, the exhibition's called The Return of the Repressed, but it's, but I, you know, in my book, notes that we've got in the museum made the point, maybe it's the return of the repressed of the museum to bring back these aspects, you know, so we feel it's a real good contribution in a way to we the should, museum. We should, we should certainly come on to some, maybe some images of previous shows by well-known artists, or not so well-known artists, but 
there is that great thing about the Freud of that sense of everything is, is permeable. It's somehow very soft security. I mean, a, 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 a rope might just be between you and the, the, the infamous uh, couch and so on. What, what, what are you entrusted with What's what, to, to really look after in that building? What are, what are the things that you have to take great care about? Um, well, obviously, the, the couch is important. You know, I mean, these things are important. We, and, I mean, the security, we, we, we're quite surprised that there haven't been more security problems than there have been. I mean, people are quite respectful. And, um, you know, you get one or two people jumping the boat, you know, trying to lie on the couch. Um, but, um, <laughs> We do have alarms, I should say. So, um, and you know, and, uh, you know, and there were also there were cameras, and the, you know, so they're, they're, you know, we have to take security quite seriously. So I suppose, like, in, in a way, my point is, it's really generous of you, you to work with artists, because some of, some of those artists are known to be quite radical, different uh, drinkers, uh, people who are suddenly in that space yeah. with with. All of these options. We, we, we have gone too far on some occasions. <laughs> I have to say that. I mean, the famous occasion when. Uh, I would say that there was a period when we more or less let the artists do what they want, uh, which I think was just not right, you know, and, 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 um, and we have kind of reined that. That back a bit, but there was one famous occasion when the Russian artist called Oleg Kulak. Oh, God. No, no. Uh, I, for those of you who don't know, it's a man who, for the best part of his, uh, a Russian artist, performance artist, who is uh, not just acting like a dog, he seems to pretty much become a he, very He loves his dog. dogs, yeah. yeah. And um, so he did, he, did, we, he did a performance in the study, um, which Part of which was he actually used my dog for his performance, which was basically having having my dog sit at the, on Freud's chair, with Oleg being analysed by the dog on Freud's couch, you know, and then and then doing some kind of Isadora Duncan dance, you know, and we were all there, it, freaking out completely, thinking, you know, with him flailing his arms about and all Freud's objects on his desk, you know, and we just thought, I mean, it was quite a nightmare. But, um, <laughs> but, but since then we've kind of, you know, we've been yeah, exactly. can, we, can we look at some images, just mm. about other shows? Because I think, for instance, with Susan Hiller, I think you, most definitely the, the, the Freud House brought out one of her best works. And I think also, I, I've never heard it not being said about Sarah Lucas's exhibition. Yeah. And that, that was, for many, one of her, her really important shows, which we can see yeah. here. And, 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 and I, I think that almost became a turning point in her career, a moment where she seemed to pull something off in this space that was, that was quite extraordinary because it brought out this aspect, this quality in her work, which had been sort of somewhat mute before. Yeah. And so you suddenly found yourself really dealing with the, with the sexual uh, 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 dynamic of the work in a very new and different light, away from sensation far yeah. more com complex and, 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 and somehow so much more edgy. Yeah. Um, but how was your experience of that well, exhibition? Uh, I suppose first of all was the working with Sarah Lucas, which mm -hmm. was an absolute pleasure. <laughs> I mean, and yeah. normally, you know, you can't say that about every artist. You know, and and um, uh, it was just very, I mean, she came along you know, I've already talked about, I mean, Susan Hiller worked at the museum for months. Uh, uh, Rachel Wyatt, um, Wyatt Withers, some Withers. Rachel Withers work, you know, is there for months. Sarah Lucas sort of turns up a couple of weeks before the show is about to open with nothing. And then sort of looks around a bit. And she's with the curator, James Putnam, who's done a number of shows. And she kind of just sort of works it out. So she pops down to Holloway Road to buy a few old mattresses and bits of furniture, you know, and then comes back and does this show. And of course, some of the things are already done, like these chairs that, that she did. Um, and other things were newly created. I mean, this piece, in, which was in the uh, an upstairs room, 
it's actually Freud's bedroom, but it just has these other bits of furniture in it. And one of the things that she did, which was really, I thought was kind of very um, understanding, was that she, she bought a little sofa for this room, and she just cut the sofa for people to sit on. And it seems like a little thing, you know. But it's like that consideration for the spectator, you know, and, and produce, a, you know, we have a little table and some, some books, a very simple thing. So you had this, so you could sit on the sofa and look at this piece. And in this, in what you can't see on this picture is that in the uh, vitrine, which is to the, to the right of that piece, there was a, a painting by somebody called Ferdinand Schmutzer who painted the iconic Freud portrait, but who also did a painting of Oedipus and the Sphinx. And it completely matched this image, these two things, you know, with this mattress and the, the neon light and the bucket and so on, and then this other Oedipus and the Sphinx. Uh, it just worked really, really well. And even above the couch, I mean, when you talk about that kind of complexity of sexuality and, you know, and you, the sort of fantasies that you imagine people would be talking about on the couch, and to have that image of her with the, with the moth-eaten T-shirt and conveniently moth-eaten just with a nipple, show, you know, and that. But it was perfect. I mean, it was beautiful. Tiny little mouths peel, take, torn out of magazines. Yeah, yeah, and, and all these, yeah. yeah, exactly these things. But with the chairs as well, I don't know if anybody has seen an image of Freud's. Um, um, Freud has a, a very interesting modernist chair, which was made for him by uh, a, a designer called. Felix Algenfeld, and it basically, it's, it's a leather chair, and the, the shape of the back is like this, and then this chair, the, the, this, the seat is a round seat, and then the arms are like this. So people, you know, immediately are drawn to this, I mean, it cries out for interpretation, it's just a really fascinating piece of furniture, and the fact that it was made specially for Freud, it's the chair he sat in to do his writing, his creative work. So it kind of has a, a, a massive resonance and, and this sort of organic form, which is at the same time modernist and archaic. So it looks like a kind of Venus of Wittenberg type figure. Um, so Freud's chair with Sarah Lucas was there in conjunction with her pieces as well. And of course, when people try to think about the chair, you know, the first thing is, well, it's a person. It looks like a person, and then you might ask, well, who? Who? Yeah. Um, you know, it could be a mother. You know, it's, you know, it's probably held, and somehow something about safety and, and finding a place that you can be creative and a kind of little space for yourself. And then somebody is bound to say, looks a bit like a penis to me. Somebody always says it looks like a penis. Because it's, and it's quite, and then you suddenly see, yeah, it's up right like that. It looks like, yeah, it's sort of, yeah, maybe, you know, and, and you begin to see that this object, which may have one meaning when you look at it the first time, may have a different meaning when you look at it again, and perhaps there's some kind of combination of male and female elements in the one piece of furniture, and something about that combination of male and female, which is, which is connected, you know, to Freud's thinking, his creativity, his his ability to, you know, go beyond taboos, and you know, so so there's something that really sort of potent about that piece of furniture, and with Sarah Lucas's piece, I think it really resonated as well. With, you know, with that. What, what what were Freud's own thoughts on on on, on art? I mean, he wasn't, um, I mean, when you go into his study, if you go
go from the standpoint of somebody who's interested in art, and of course the first thing that strikes you, it's so old-fashioned. You know, here's one of the founding fathers of modernism, whose own artistic tastes are basically, you know, you know either antique, antiquity, or, I mean, he also has a kind of whole collection of prints from Renaissance Italy, with, you know, religious prints and stuff, which aren't on exhibition, but which, uh, you know, which he has, you know, as part of his collecting. Um, so his own texts are very old-fashioned and kind of almost prosaic, you could say. You know. um, on the other hand, he, you know, he was one of the people who, when he's talking about creative writing or creative, you know, he's developing theories which, of course, are modern and, you know, and are to do with, you know, what some of these artists, you know, are, are dealing with. So, you know, whether he, um, yeah, it's, a it's a difficult one. I mean, what did you, what do you... Well, I, I, I'm always struck by his, his sort of basic collecting tendencies. I see him more perhaps in that camp than in uh, yeah. being an original artist, as it were, but it's always struck me that in his relationship to Egyptology, which seems to be also quite fashionable for the time, oh, yeah. it is, is an interesting one. So, what I remember once working with a German artist, Andreas Hofer, uh, who, who, who did a show with you, and, and Andreas had a huge collection. This is an artist in his, in, his four, in his 40s, but he had a massive collection of toys, of um, superhero toys, Japanese style manga toys, and so on. And he went about integrating those next to very ancient Egyptian objects. And they did seem to speak a similar oh, language. Nice. And it was, it was fascinating to see um, that type of interaction. I suppose that would be my next question, which is, what, what artists just don't say no to Freud, do they? They just love the option of the show at the Freud Museum. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the reason I say that is because there, there's a tendency, I mean, artists are, they obviously want to be themselves, don't they? I mean, they you know, and, and artists kind of, you know, so on the one hand, they want to show at the Ford Museum, yeah, and we get a lot of requests. We don't often commission, but we get lots of requests, so we kind of select. Um, uh, but on the other hand, they also want to take over. Yeah. So it's, it's so there's a, there's a, you know, on one hand, you want to get involved with Freud, but on the other hand, you want to get rid of Freud. So it's quite an ambivalent relationship. And of course, part of the kind of trick of curating or helping to curate artists at the museum is trying to find that kind of point of contact, you know, how they can actually live with Freud, you know, how they can feed off each other and learn from each other. And of course, we've done that. That was amazing, you know, because yeah, Ellen Gallagher, I mean, what you left out of your story yeah. before was that Ellen Gallagher also went on an oceanographic trip yeah. when she was a student and she went and did oceanography and was studying little sea creatures which she was drawing. You know, so she, you know, so she and Freud had this experience because she knew nothing about the Freud and we knew nothing about her. You know, but of course that connection between Freud working in an oceanographic laboratory in Trieste and yeah. Lennon Gallagher having done this, you know, so, and it's a kind of unexpected thing that formed this point of contact so that part of Ellen Gallagher's exhibition could be Freud's drawings used as part of the exhibition, you know, so it's a kind of... You know, well, that was a kind of magical moment because I don't think in this case the artist even knew all was aware. Oh, no, no, it's a complete surprise. Yeah. I just went off yeah. and plucked yeah. out these amazing... Yeah. Yeah. Drawings. Actually, the drawings themselves reminded me enormously of Lucy and Freud's drawings. And um, I've always wondered, did Lucy and ever visit the, the Freud Museum? He, as far as I know, he never did. Yeah. I mean, Lucy obviously wasn't an easy person to... Yeah. You know, he, he, he'd, um, as far as I know, he never visited the museum. Yeah. It's funny to think of um, uh, these artists engaging with Freud um, and, and it being an almost e egotistical clash of um, personalities, and very much what they have built up in their mind is is the great um, the great Freud, and and they do see themselves as well sort of matching up to it, which I quite yeah. I've often found is quite funny in that sort of monster from the id sort of 
Yeah, no, it's an interesting way to do it. But, tell me, I was just going to ask, is there ever any shows that you felt didn't work or you just thought this is just not connecting? Uh, well, well, yeah, there are probably some shows that I think didn't work, but, but, um, and also shows which I thought did work, but where the artist was kind of, you know, a bit disgruntled, you know, let's say. And I particularly think of Matt Collishaw. You know, when Matt Collishaw came and he, he did what I thought was a fantastic exhibition. You know, he, um, I don't know if anybody saw that. I've got anything here. Um, he... There was one room which was completely black and a projector moving around and flashing up images yeah. onto light-sensitive material. So it was literally the after image, or felt like the, the retinal burn of images. And you would be suddenly in a room, small room upstairs, I recall clearly, where there were quite sort of odd images of Victorian yeah, prostitutes. I mean these, the, well, these, no, these images were images from... Um, Hysterical women, wasn't it? Yeah, these yes. were images that were photographs of, done by Jean-Martin Charcot, who was the great French neurologist who Freud studied with in saint petrier in, in Paris, um, and then and learned a lot from. And, and this was the first use of the kind of medical use of photography, so it's quite, quite an important point. Uh, Matt Collishaw came to the museum, you know, we talked, he hadn't known about these photographs, but I'd seen his show at the Haunch of Venison, where he'd used the yeah. prostitute images of, feet of ch child prostitutes, Victorian ch child prostitutes. And I just thought of these images and thought how brilliant it would work in the Freud Museum. So he came, and above Freud's couch, there's also a print of Jean-Martin Charcot giving one of his Wednesday lectures and demonstrating to you know, a group of doctors you know, that his power over hysteria, really, with using a, a female hysteric who is hypnotized, she's swooning, it's you know, a bit of a sexual injury, the sort of, you know, dress is sort of falling off, and she's just falling. And this image, which Freud had above the couch, had above the couch in London, but not in Vienna, um, he came one of the kind of bases of, of Matt Collishaw's exhibition, uh, and he called it hysteria. So he, you know, most of the things were working on these kinds of images around this idea of hysteria, and so on. And then he had a, a, one of his zoetropes, which are the light. Does everybody know these pieces? They're, the zoetropes are basically. Um, the kind of contraptions that, well, a zoetrope is you have slits in a barrel and you, yes. go and you see moving images. So he's created that in 3D by having lights flashing on and off with a sculpture that, that um, rotates very quickly in sync with the lights and then you see move, a moving 3D uh, effect. And it's kind of brilliant stuff. And in this one, he had little sort of imps uh, being cruel to animals. So it was, uh, you know, trying to spear a snail or bash a bird's eggs and the birds were fluttering that, you know, and it was kind of very interesting about naughty boys and aggression and childhood aggression and so on. Um, and that, and it, was, it was brilliant. And, it, and we had that in the room of Anna Freud, who was a child psychoanalyst, right next to her couch. And it just worked brilliantly. I mean, it was just really interesting to have, using this image that's above Freud's couch, having naughty children there in the room of Anna Freud, one of the pioneers of child psychoanalysis. And, you know, it just, everything worked. Then he did a, an interview for Tate Modern, and basically he said, well, all this, I don't know why we had to go to the Freud Museum. It's like, I'd much rather have a white cube, you know, it'd be much you know. And then you think, well, I'm ungrateful, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great show, I have to say. It was a great show, was you know. And yeah. what was interesting, you know, and, and, and I've kind of, you know, I did feel a bit sort of, you know, and he was obviously disgruntled, he didn't get enough 
people in or publicity wasn't good enough, you know. But the action show was fantastic, and he kind of you know, basically said, I, I wish he was a white kid. The fact that he never wouldn't have called it wouldn't have called it hysteria. I mean, nothing about these images. Had the whole show based on coming to the Freud Museum, talking to us, we going to his studio, lots of, con you know. There was nowhere to be seen. It was just this sense that something wasn't quite right. And, you know, maybe he's got a point there. You know, that's the thing. Maybe, he's got, maybe art, in some way, does have its own space. You know, in fact, you know, even despite all the politics of the white cube and the kind of, you know, all the things you can say about it, perhaps there's something about that space which is appropriate to art, but the museum isn't. You know, it's, it's a possibility. <coughs> question I wanted to ask was, um, I, I think one of the, I mean, apart from it being this kind of incredible off the beaten path museum is that sense of what you guys do for the artists, because um, I've experienced that firsthand in as much as that they may have an interest in Freud, whereas, uh, and I, I want to talk to you about your interest in, in, in Freud, but you have an absolute knowledge at times, it seems to me. Um, so, an artist might talk a little bit about Freud, but you're able to pick things out. I'm also wondering if you're not with some of the artists thinking, would you like to come and lie down and talk through this? But at the same time, I, I just wanted to ask about your relationship to Freud. You mentioned earlier about going to Vienna and bursting into tears, but what has been your lifelong relationship to Freud? Yeah, it's been pretty long. I mean, I suppose 40 years worth of reading and um, uh, and you know, the thing is that like these people are coming on their pilgrimage, I mean my relationship, you know, it, it is, I suppose you'd say Freud is a transformed figure. I mean, you know, when you read a book, you know, on the one hand you're reading and getting information, but on the other hand there's some other kind of emotional connection going on, you know, and, and you can't read everything, you can't connect with it, you know, but you, you know, it's like a sort of falling in love, in a way, you know, with this person, his body of work, his way of thinking, and you kind of make that kind of connection. So, so there is a, it is an emotional thing, definitely. You know, and of course, I mean, the simple way to think about that is, I suppose, you know, if I, to, to answer it in one sort of sentence, well, I suppose he's a bit of a father. You know, but of course that says a lot if you, you know, because what, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that that, that is an, a, a big emotional thing and, and of course the artists who may have not had that connection, they may have that connection with other people in their thoughts, mm -hmm. you know, and, and part of our job is to, because, because that kind of relationship is also one of respect as well, you know, and you have to try and have that, it's also one of of kind of, uh, there's an element of, of su submission involved. You know, I don't, if I, if I read something that Freud says that seems completely stupid, I don't immediately say, oh, well, what's in it? You know, and, and there's a lot that it can be a bit stupid. But you kind of read it, you know, but for me, that wouldn't be the end of the process to, to be able to dismiss it because I've kind of submitted myself to this body of work. So I try to work out you know, what it meant, you know, it's kind of, so it's, it's, so it's a different kind of um, have relationship. You, have you ever found the artists have shown you a different aspect of Freud or something, that they, they've taken you to a new reading of Freud? The, the, the artists? Yeah. Um, that's a good question, yeah, I can't, I mean, I'd have to think about it. You would have to have prepared me earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell, us, tell us about your... Tell us about your latest show, because I know for you, Bourgeois has been an artist you've admired for many, many years. I remember I, I, I said to you when at the opening, which uh, it just opened recently, and I said, you've landed the big fish, I am well done, because I know that's been a, 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 a really long-running interest. Tell me about the show. Well, the show, I mean, it, it's, um, yeah, I mean, obviously her work is of interest, and I don't, you, you may have already read a little bit about the show. And uh, it has, the, the core of the, the exhibition was supposed to be the writing that Louise Bourgeois did when she was in analysis. So for 
No, nearly 30 years she was in analysis, 10 of which it was four or five times a week. So it's intense analytic uh, experience. And during that time, as well as writing her diary, uh, she wrote about her analysis and wrote obsessively. So Louise Bourgeois, in a way, was almost as much of a writer as she was a artist, as I would say. I mean, and there's a thousand pages of, of scribbles, you could say, that were found in a couple of boxes, uh, you know, a few years before she died. And that these were, you know, some of these selected, obviously, you, know, you could do all of them, but some of these selected by the curator, Philip Lowett Smith, who's the literary, uh, what's his title, curator? Yeah, I mean, I, I, and he seems to be the emerging curator with, as it were, what could be the But he was actually brought on, I mean, he's been yeah. working with the archive for 10 years, yeah. and he was brought on for the, for the text and yeah. all the stuff. Yeah. Uh, but he's now developed into an art curator as well. And he, he selected certain of these uh, works. We also went over to New York and looked at, through them as well, and it's kind of an amazing experience. Were you, were you um, in the house? And, and in the house, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so, so that was the kind of basis because she writes about analysis, she's in analysis, she's read psychoanalytic works, she's, you know, she's somebody who's, you know, came to art from mathematics and philosophy, she's a kind of intellectual person, you know, so there's all this aspect, and then there are these works that she's produced and this kind of fame that she developed in, to, at the end of her life. Um, so it's been, like you say, a big fish, <laughs> or a big fish, but somebody who's, you know, I mean, th this group I had this morning basically said, this is completely at home in the museum, this work is, you know, it, it just is married to the museum. In fact, <laughs> in fact, they said, we think that Louise Bourgeois should have met Freud and they got married. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just realised it's married to me. I mean, so they had this little fantasy, you know, this <laughs> And it's true, you know, in a way, I could kind of see the point, you know, that, that, you know, you can imagine, you know, I mean, and, and there was a point when Freud came to London, he stopped off in Paris just for one day few hours really to stay at, uh, waiting for his train and he was at the home of Mary Bonaparte who was uh, Princess Mary Bonaparte who was the Princess and the Bonaparte and um, and of course they went on to London and Louise Bourgeois left for New York in the same year you know so I imagine that they were in Paris at the same at the same time the closest they ever came together apart from in the museum now, I suppose. Yeah. Well, as I say, uh, it's incredible what you do. I mean, just um, how, how, in a roundabout way, what, what has the Freud Museum done for London, done for the artists? I mean, what, what's your achievement there? Uh, I think we were one of the... I mean, there's different circles of influence, aren't there? I mean, I think we were one of the first museums which started taking contemporary art seriously as something in the museum and which opened its doors to contemporary art in a way that was, that was itself quite open. I mean that we allowed the artist freedom, we, can't, we thought what we can learn from the artworks coming in. I mean, for instance, using in educational work with school students and so on. Um, and, if, and the reason why we were able to do that is because of the intellectual connection between Freud, Freud's ideas, you know, dreams, dream symbolism, images, hieroglyphics that Freud studied, uh, automatic writing, free association, all, you know, these ideas that, that became part of the kind of artistic lexicon as well. Um, and so, so and, and since then, there's quite a lot of museums who, who I think have basically started doing the same thing. I think there has been an influence within that small kind of museum sector. In terms of the wider art world, 
don't know. I mean, you'd be better placed to. Oh, I mean, you know, we have a bit of a reputation now, I think, mm -hmm. and people kind of take us seriously. Um, and perhaps, you know, there's something that, that we can offer in terms of a sort of intellectual engagement with our practice and, and taking that seriously. You know? So, hopefully, uh, a fruitful combination in the future. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask if any of you have any questions. Don't be fearful, we're in fairly intimate surroundings. So, if any of you have a question, <coughs> Four Ivan, now would be a good time. Um, I need that piece of silence. Thank you. I was thinking because, like, we uh, at the Cowley show, uh, I was thinking, like, as a curator for a space that is, I mean, I'm so significant, how, how much value do you think you put into, like, the exhibitions, like, in terms of um, dealing or relating to the space? Uh, quite, yeah, quite a bit. I mean, obviously, we work with the artists before they do, you know, so we're trying to talk to them. Um, sometimes it doesn't work out and we have to pull the plug, you know, so if we feel it, it's not working. Um, with somebody like Matt Collishaw, um, you know, we, we often do sort of leaflets and written material that kind of try to explain why this work is here, what the importance is, what the connection is to Freud's ideas and the so, you know, and the space. You know. So we, we try to kind of, you know, it, it often requires supplementary material to integrate the work into the space as far as the visitor is concerned. So often, I mean, it's been, just one example, I mean, it's been remarkable. This, this uh, Alice Anderson was just, last year, I don't know if anybody saw it, where the whole of the museum was was tied round with these ropes. Um, uh, and it was quite amazing, I mean, it, and it was called Childhood Rituals. And it was so obviously connected to Freudian ideas, it was just sort of, you wouldn't have thought that anybody would have a problem, but people were really incensed about it. And so we had to kind of just try to explain you know, what Freud says about childhood rituals, how he talks about childhood rituals, what, you know, what this connection is between this work here and these body of ideas that you, the Freud person, has come to this museum from the basis of. You know? so, so, so there is that sense of trying to, you know, you know, having perhaps to integrate the work by adding something to the you know, supplementary said it was her favourite piece and she also called it a self-portrait 
know, and it's just the <laughs> I mean, it's such a powerful thing, you know, above and above the couch, you know, and you kind of, you know, I'm sure I, I doubt if Freud would have approved, but there's something quite appropriate about that. But you know, this kind of form that speaks of the thing that became more and more important in Freud in his theory, which is the castration. It speaks to that as a, and this thing, this anxiety at the core of being that Freud thought it was, you know, and somehow that seems to be an appropriate place for it. At the foot of the couch that you can't see on this, on this picture, Freud placed an Egyptian death mask, which is also, of course, you know, quite, you know and both those things of this sort of relationship, you know, seem to me really. Um, but of course, you could think of that as you know, as a railing against the father. But it's also something, you know, but it's also something quite poignant about that in terms of submission as well. I think to, to the father. And this, mm -hmm. It makes it all more poignant. Yeah. Great. Okay, one um, more question. I was interested in obviously this tension between what this is as a museum and how an artist, a contemporary artist, engages with the objects. And I was very struck in your narrative, which is very good to hear, but so many times you use this term, what you allowed artists to do, or how Freud would have approved, or there, there seems to be a kind of underlying um, source of um, commissions, yeah. um, which is, you know, something that obviously... You know, like when, you know like when your mum tells you when you're a teenager, this isn't a hotel, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, this is our house. <laughs> of, course we got, of course we grant permission. And of course we, you know, because, but we, you know, we're custodians. Of, you know, it's not like we can just do... You know, we, so the people who work in the museum, and who've been there like I have for 25 years. You know, we're custodians of that space. We can't just, uh, you know, of course we have to give permission and we have to be the parents. But I think <laughs> it, I'm really not talking just about the permission yeah. what one could move around or um, how materially uh, this is all to be you know, protected. But I, I feel there is some other, um, something else going on there which is also a very problematic um, experience for an artist to work, in fact, with any museum, um, is to be absorbed into its narrative and how one resists that. And of course, you know, in that particular museum, it seems that obviously you will be very happy when this, what you call the marriage, is sort of consecrated. And yet, you know, for most artists, that's you, not necessarily yeah, the best yeah. way. Do you, of do you mean do we do we um, try to affect art exhibitions in order to for that exhibition to give some kind of credence to an idealization of Freud? Is that basically what you mean? Are we trying to kind of you no? Know, I mean, it's kind of yes and no is the answer. I mean, uh, it's probably I'd be more guilty than anyone of that. But things like, you know, an exhibition by Stuart Grizzly, who, who, who did, he was a performance artist, but also a sculptor and so on. And he did an exhibition called the Museum of Audio, which was basically, well, I can't really say it in any other way, shit. basically shit, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like tables and tables of shit everywhere. You know, now, a lot of people found that kind of, funnily enough, a lot of people found it quite interesting. <laughs> But a lot of people did find that quite upsetting. As if, interestingly, though, of course, the reason why we would think that can that is a connection is because Freud had a, a dream once where he saw a piece of furniture, a piece of furniture which was the couch, covered in feces in various states of, of, of freshness. <laughs> this is his dream. You know. And he uses the phrase, a whole museum of excrement. So, so we could, you know, there's a connection. 
there's a connection between Freud's Museum of Excrement and Stuart Bisley's Museum of Excrement that we could make. We're not there to, uh, you know, I don't think that's there to sort of idealise Freud, but it's there because, the, you know, but, but there is actually a connection there, and people would find that interesting, you know, and, and something can be kind of, you know, between the two, something can be got for the art and something can be got for, for you know, it's, so, uh, so, so I don't know, I don't know, I, I, I hope we don't do, do that, but, but, um, but at the same time we have to also protect something, we have to protect something. I know that's not a complete answer to you. Well, we, we will hopefully catch you in a bit, um, but just for now, um, thank you so much for coming down at such short notice and, and, and giving